Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Tracy Johnson, and I'm the Dean of Life Sciences here at UCLA. And before we get started, I just want to mention a few housekeeping items. Uh, this event is being recorded, so both the chat and the Q&A functions have been disabled. Um, we feel really fortunate to have so many of us here this evening and so many people who are interested in this event. Um, but unfortunately, because of the large number of attendees, it also means that we aren't going to be able to take questions in real time. Um, so thank you to all of you who submitted your questions in advance, and we're going to try to address as many of those as possible. Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's virtual event, Women in Science. As March is Women's History Month and International Women's Day was just a few days ago, uh, we thought it would be fitting to highlight a few of the remarkable female faculty in the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology. And it gives me particular pleasure to highlight my colleagues here tonight, as this is my home department where my laboratory studies how messenger RNAs are made and processed by the cell to perform their particular functions. But tonight's webinar, you're going to learn about the panelists' impactful biomedical research focused on finding solutions to high impact problems. You're also going to hear about their experiences as women in science and their advice for the next generation. So we hope that you find their stories and this glimpse into the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology as compelling as we do. So before I introduce you to our wonderful chair of the department, I want to say a few words about the department of MCDB. So as a faculty member in molecular cell and developmental biology, I've had the good fortune to witness the inclusive collaborative environment in the department firsthand. MCDB advances our knowledge of life on earth at the cellular and molecular levels. Our mission is to educate the next generation of scholars and professionals, leaders and citizens of the world by fully integrating our students into the cutting edge research that we do. Our faculty and our students are involved in every aspect of cutting edge research from stem cell biology to cancer research to the computational interpretation of genomics data uh, to understanding development of the heart. You know, our research goal is to address the most conceptually important issues related to gene regulation and morphogenesis and, and bring the most innovative approaches to these investigations and then to translate these discoveries in order to address the most pressing human problems in biology, health, and sustainability. So I'm now really pleased to introduce you to my colleague and chair, uh, Professor um, of, de of the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology, Amanda Clark. Amanda will then introduce you to tonight's three um, outstanding panelists. So Professor Clark is an Australian born American stem cell biologist who specializes in pluripotency and germline cell differentiation. She earned her PhD in cell and developmental biology from the University of Melbourne and completed postdoctoral studies at Baylor College of Medicine and at the University of California, San Francisco. Amanda joined the faculty in 2006 as an assistant professor, and she's been the chair of the department since 2017. Amanda's lab was the first in the world to isolate prenatal human germline cells, to analyze their genomes, and then to identify the stages of human prenatal germline development. And she's particularly interested in generating germline cells from stem cells in order to model fertility, infertility, and early pregnancy loss. Results from this groundbreaking work will provide a biological understanding not only of the cell and the molecular basis of human life and child health, but potentially provide the foundation for therapies to overcome human infertility. So in addition to her role as professor and chair of the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology, Amanda is also a key member of the Eli and Edith Broad Center of Regenerative Medicine and Stem Cell Research. And she's a member of the executive committee for the International Society for Stem Cell Research. We are really fortunate to have her as our, our colleague and chair. And so please join me in welcoming Professor Amanda Clark. 
Good evening. Thank you for your kind introduction, Dean Johnson, and for letting everyone know what makes our department so special. I have the distinct honor of chairing the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's webinar on women in science. I hope, our hope is that tonight's event not only is enlightening for you, but also sparks conversation and action. We encourage you to make a difference with the knowledge you gain. It is my pleasure to introduce the three molecular cell and developmental biology faculty who will be speaking with us this evening. Our first speaker is Professor Hanna Mikola. Hanna received her MD and PhD from the University of Helsinki, Finland. She performed her postdoctoral research at the University of Lund in Sweden and at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at Harvard Medical School. She joined UCLA and the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology in 2005. Hannah studies how blood stem cells are generated during embryonic development and how their ability to self-renew and give rise to differentiated blood cell types is orchestrated by cues from their microenvironment. Her goal is to enhance the understanding of these processes in order to efficiently and effectively generate blood stem cells in the lab. A readily available supply of these cells would greatly improve transplantation treatments for blood diseases such as leukemia and sickle cell disease. Hannah's research could pave the way for the production of healthy blood stem cells in the lab using patient-specific blood stem cells, which would allow patients to be their own bone marrow donors. Hannah is an active member of the Eli and Edith Broad Center for Regenerative Medicine and Stem Cell Research and of the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hannah Mikola. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It is a true honor to be here this evening to represent one of the many, many outstanding women in science uh, at U UCLA. Today, I would like to share a glimpse of my, my journey in trying to understand how to make blood forming stem cells to improve the treatments of leukemia and other blood diseases. You might ask what brings a young woman scientist all the way from Finland to Los Angeles to study stem cells. Looking back, this was probably not a coincidence. Growing up, these images of children with leukemia always stopped me. I was terrified, sometimes so badly that I could not sleep at night. My response to my fear was, let me get to know it better. With that goal, I went to medical school in Helsinki with the firm idea that I would become a hematologist and cure all the leukemia patients that came my way. In med school, meeting the patients in the hospital, I was faced with the great disappointment. We did not have the tools to cure them. Sometimes we did not even know what was wrong. How can you cure something that you don't even know how it's broken? So this uh, experience completely changed my career path. Uh, I went through medical school, I got my PhD, and I decided that my, my um, role in this lofty goal was to be in science and try to understand uh, blood stem cell regulation. After I finished my um, MD and PhD in Finland, I went to do postdoctoral studies in Lund and Boston, and ultimately, in 2005, started my own research lab here at UCLA. Until then, I had mainly been studying blood stem cells in a mouse model. But here, my goal was to, to really translate this all to human, to understand how human hematopoietic stem cells or blood forming stem cells are regulated and how leukemia develops in them and how leukemia could be treated better. Ultimately, we have to treat humans and not just mice. Uh, we know that blood stem cells can be used to treat leukemias and other devastating blood diseases. However, not even half of the patients can find a matching bone marrow donor. When I started to work with blood stem cells in Sweden over 20 years ago, 
our, our goal seemed very simple. Let's just put them in culture and learn how to expand them. This has turned out to be a very challenging goal. In 1998, at that time, also human embryonic stem cells were derived. And then 2006, human induced pluripotent stem cells were derived, which makes it now possible to take your skin cell and make it go back very beginning of, of development in the embryonic stem cell state. And now if we only knew how to make them to differentiate to the cell type of interest, we could make any cell type such as blood stem cells from your own pluripotent stem cells, a custom source of blood stem cells. However, this has not been successful to date and largely because we still don't understand what regulates the unique property of hematopoietic stem cells. How do they self-renew? How do they engraft? upon transplantation? How do they generate all the different blood cell types? And more importantly, uh, how do they maintain this balance throughout our lifetime without making a mistake that might give rise to leukemia? So every day, the blood stem cells have to make decisions whether to self-renew, stay quiescent, differentiate, or be mobilized. And by this way, they can maintain the blood cell supply through the rest of our lifetime. The key for this homeostasis is asymmetric self renewal, where one cell remains a stem cell and one starts differentiating. If you actually want to expand the number of stem cells, you need to tell them to self renew symmetrically. And this is possible, but when we try to do this in culture, these cells are largely destined for differentiation or death. So how could we make this happen? We essentially had to fail first so that we could learn from our failures. While learning from all these situations where blood stem cells lose self-renewal abilities, such as during differentiation or culture, we identified the genes that always go with the self-renewing cell. And from these studies, we found a very important stem cell regulator called MLLT3. We learned that when we restored the expression of MLLT3 in blood stem cells in culture, we were able to expand them in number over 12 fold. And this is clinically very significant because now we would have a much greater supply of blood stem cells for uh, downstream applications. And uh, now we can also understand what does self-renewal really mean? And what MLLT3 told us that self-renewal means that, that you have to renew an active mark in those key blood cell regulatory gene every time, every time when the cell divides. And in this way, uh, enabling symmetric self-renewal in culture. However, the goal to make a hematopoietic stem cell from pluripotent stem cells is even more challenging because we're not only dealing to how to maintain something that was established, but how to make it from scratch. And now we have a lot of question marks. Where do hematopoietic stem cells come from? They come from a endothelial intermediate, but how does this endothelial intermediate look like? How do the early hematopoietic stem cells look like? They look very different than in the adult, but if we can't find them, how can we study them? Answering these questions has been um, a challenge. So in some ways, we've also had to wait till technologies have been developing. Today, we can now utilize this very novel technology called single cell RNA sequencing, where we can take any sample of interest such as this region of an embryo where the hematopoietic stem cells are being generated from the wall of the, of the endothelial lining. And we can look the genes and programs that are active in any given cell. All of these are individual cells. And by using the knowledge that we have gained over the years about the genes that have to be expressed in blood stem cells, we can now find the cluster of cells that are blood stem cells. We can say, yep, there they are. There are the blood stem cells. So now that we found them, we can finally study them and, and learn what makes them unique compared to the other cells that don't know how to self-renew. Where in the developing embryo do we find them so that we can understand how those unique environments support their development. This is absolutely critical so that we can essentially generate a map how to make a hematopoietic stem cell from the very beginning and how to support it, this cell during its journey 
when it's just being specified, when it's maturing to the functional hematopoietic stem cell that can do its job when transplanted, when it's expanding the number, teaching us about more about the symmetric self renewal. Essentially, we can now read this missing script for hematopoietic stem cell generation and apply this to, to the cells that we are making in culture and see how far are we getting in this map. This knowledge is also critical for understanding diseases such as neonatal leukemias that already originate from blood cells in utero. Only by understanding the unique nature of these blood forming cells during development can we understand why these diseases are often more aggressive and therapy resistant. And finally, I would like to thank my uh, lab members, my collaborators. I've listed some of them here. It's not possible to list all the wonderful people that we get to work with. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank my funding sources and especially highlight the philanthropy that we have received through UCLA. This is essential when we're asking bold questions uh, in, a, in a rapidly moving field. At the end of the day, Nobody can do this alone. We need a team to work with, team who shares the same dreams about curing these devastating diseases and figuring out a way how to make it happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing your incredibly important work on blood stem cells. And it's wonderful to see how you integrate so many undergraduate graduate students in your research uh, on this cutting edge research program. It's wonderful to see. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Karen Lyons. Professor Lyons received a Bachelor of Arts in Genetics from UC Berkeley, a PhD in Genetics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and her postdocs from Vanderbilt and Harvard Universities. She's been a faculty member at UCLA since 1995. Karen studies the roles of regulatory factors during vertebrate development, focusing on skeletal tissues. Her lab is investigating the genes and signaling pathways that contribute to the onset and progression of osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is the leading cause of long-term disability in the United States. It causes the cushioning cartilage on the surface of bones at joints to wear away. As the disease gets worse, the cartilage disappears and bone rubs on bone, ouch, leading to restricted mobility and considerable pain. For the most part, the causes of osteoarthritis are unknown. It is currently estimated that 80% of the US population will have radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis by age 65. No cures are yet available to generate or regenerate the normal articular cartilage. Therefore, there is an urgent and growing need for treatments that can repair this type of cartilage. Understanding the molecular mechanisms underlying the formation and maintenance of chondrocytes is of paramount importance for the development of strategies that prevent or treat this increasingly prevalent disease. In addition to being a professor in molecular cell and developmental biology, Karen is also a professor and vice chair of research in orthopedic surgery at UCLA's David Geffen School of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Professor Karen Lyons. Well, first of all, thank you all for um, letting me have this chance, this wonderful opportunity to uh, meet with you. It's, um, it's, it's wonderful that we have these, these chances in this um, remote era. I, I just wanted to start out by saying a little bit about my career path, how I got to UCLA and, and into uh, this topic of cartilage and bone formation. So I've always been interested in genetics. I think I was, uh, my interest was ignited when I was in high school and I'm a California native. So I went to uh, University of California, Berkeley and got a BA in genetics there. I then um, loved genetics even more after that experience, experience, especially after a Drosophila genetics lab, and decided to go to the University of Wisconsin-Madison for a PhD. At the time, that was one of the best genetics programs in the country. And I was really very fortunate to be in the lab of Oliver Smithies. He um, won the Nobel Prize 
for inventing the technology that allows us to use embryonic stem cells to make defined mutations in mice. So I was in the lab when this work was happening. And when I wasn't in the lab, I was learning to do things like um, snowshoe or uh, snow skiing or ver various other uh, outdoor activities because the winters are long in Wisconsin. In any case, I was very excited um, after learning all about this technology to be able to make defined mutations in the mouse and decided that I wanted to apply that technology to developmental biology to try to understand the functions of individual genes. Um, and, and we could do that now for the very first time in a very defined way. So I went on and did postdoctoral research at Harvard University and at Vanderbilt University, where um, I worked with some leading developmental biologists who both happened to be women, my two postdoctoral mentors. Um, in between, I learned a lot about whitewater canoeing and met my husband that way. Um, the, one of the things that happened to me while I was a postdoctoral fellow in the lab is that I had discovered a gene. We were just doing um, screens for interesting genes that had cognates in, Dr in Drosophila. And I came across a gene that turned out to be essential for cartilage and bone formation. It's now known as bone morphogenetic protein. Well, that was very exciting to bone biologists at the time, and it led to an opportunity for me to go to a, a pharmaceutical company and to work a little bit in that setting. So that was really exciting to be able to see what bioscience was like. But in the end, I really wanted to ask much more fundamental questions about cartilage and bone formation. So that's why I decided to come back to academia and how I ended up being a faculty member with a joint appointment in MCDB and in orthopedic surgery. Um, oh. <laughs> There we go. So now I just want to introduce a little bit about the system that I use, that I study, and that's the skeletal system. I'm sure you all know that the skeletal system is the reason that we can locomote, that we can move. And um, it's the reason we can feed ourselves, of course, and, and all our activities that happen on land. You also know, I'm sure, that the major part of the skeletal system is composed of bones, the hard mineralized tissue that you can see here in some sections, but actually during development, the bones start out, or most of the bones in the body actually start out as cartilage templates. So here we're looking at some embryos and mice at two different stages, and they're stained with some different stains to detect cartilage and bone. The blue is cartilage, the red is bone, and what you can see over time is that the amount of blue disappears and the amount of red increases, and that's reflecting this replacement of the cartilage tissue, which you can see here in this slide, with bone, the mineralized tissue. And in adults, the only place we retain significant amounts of cartilage is on our joints. And as uh, Dr. Clark mentioned, this is a very um, important tissue because when it gets degraded, we end up with osteoarthritis. So the final tissue that we study in the lab would be the connective tissues like tendons and ligaments that actually connect the muscles to the bones to allow locomotion. So that's our system. And then what are the questions we're actually asking in the lab? So first of all, I mentioned to you that I'm very interested in understanding how uh, specific genes act in development. And so our main question then is what genes actually control cartilage, tendon, and bone formation? And we study that primarily by using uh, the embryonic stem cells in order to generate defined mutations in specific genes. And then we were, were able to determine whether those genes are essential by looking at what happens when we delete them. So this is an example of a mouse skeleton and a newborn mouse skeleton that's a normal one. And in this case, we ablated this specific gene and you can see that the skeleton is very abnormal. So now we know for sure that this gene is essential during uh, cartilage development. And so then the next question, of course, having uh, identified the genes of interest would be to understand how it is they act. And it's that question that consumes most of our time in the lab. We attempt to think about this on multiple levels, molecular levels, cellular levels, and whole tissue levels. But ultimately we wanna know, for example, what signaling pathways these molecules are acting in, 
how they interact with each other. So here we see several molecules and I won't go into the details, but we're putting together pathways of gene activity here that activate different uh, uh, ex gene ex uh, signal transduction pathways. And ultimately those pathways are gonna control cell behavior. They're gonna control the behavior of, or the, the expression of other genes. They're gonna control cell um, activity like proliferation and differentiation and ultimately that's going to tell the tissue um, how it's going to form so those are the the main questions and the ultimate goal then is to understand whether we can use this information to repair damaged cartilage and bone and as uh, dr clark mentioned one of the major diseases in uh, in the skeletal system is osteoarthritis and so and there are to date no cures for this uh, for this particular disease Another one we care very much about is osteoporosis, which is the thinning of bone. And this um, condition uh, causes fractures, especially in women as they age. And in fact, uh, deaths due to osteoporotic fracture outnumber uh, deaths due to breast cancer, stroke, and heart disease combined in women. So it's a very serious problem. So now um, just thinking a little bit about our basic approaches. I mentioned to you that we really focus on analysis of mutant phenotypes. What happens when we knock a gene out? What happens to the uh, cartilage and the bone uh, during development and later? So that's our main approach is we, we've identified candidate genes. We identify a gene as a candidate as maybe important in cartilage or bone through a variety of techniques. It can be through uh, studies like RNA-seq, like um, Dr. Mikola just explained, or it can be through directly looking at expression of genes. And in this case, I'm showing you an image where we are uh, looking at expression of two different genes by um, introducing a fluorescent protein um, in the, in, inside the gene to see where that gene is turned on and both of them are on in cartilage. So using techniques like this, we, folk, we choose our candidate genes to analyze and then we generate our mutants. Following that, we then analyze the phenotypes, the mutant mice to try to define their mechanisms of action. So as an example, I already mentioned um, this particular gene, it happens to be a growth factor receptor. And when we ablated this gene, we have um, a mouse that has a very deformed skeleton and we can use other techniques than to go into far more detail to understand the mechanism. So one example of that here is just looking at a histological slide. We can see that there are major problems with the organization of the tissue. We can go in more detail using techniques like microcomputer computerized tomography to look in higher detail. In this case, we're looking at bone from a different mutant. And you can see that in this particular mutant, we have far less bone than in the wild type. We can go at the cellular level and take cells out of these mutants and ask how well they are able to form specific tissues. In this case, we can look at stem cells, skeletal stem cells, and ask whether they can uh, become bone or whether they have a propensity to become other tissues like fat. And finally, we can do various biochemical analyses to understand how the specific mutations are affecting signalings and interacting with other proteins. Our end goal in all of this is to try to develop biological therapeutics to treat skeletal diseases. And um, this is just an example of an attempt to, at a recent, recent study where we're trying to develop a strategy to address post-traumatic osteoarthritis. As Dr. Clark mentioned, osteoarthritis is the leading cause of long-term disability in the United States. There are no cures at all for this disease. And the only thing that uh, we can do right now is a, a total joint replacement, which is not going to last forever and, and certainly not um, anywhere near as good as the native tissue. So um, in this particular case, we're looking at an adult joint uh, in two different ways, micro CT and then through a section. The orange tissue is the cartilage. When we induced osteoarthritis in this tissue, as we see here, we have um, a case where all that cartilage has become degraded. And so the bone is grating on bone that causes a great deal of pain and loss of mobility. When we have introduced this particular therapeutic, which we discovered because of our developmental biology um, studies, looking at mutant phenotypes, we're actually able to see a large restoration of the um, cartilage surface. And we reduce some of the other um, areas where we see damage to the whole joint. So we're excited about that approach. It shows that understanding developmental biology 
can give you insights that are relevant to human disease. And of course, none of this happens in a vacuum. Um, it takes a village. And um, just showing you some slides, uh, largely uh, undergraduates actually have been running my lab for the last couple of years. So I'm super excited to have them uh, be able to come back in the lab soon. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Karen, for letting us know about the exciting work that's been going on in your lab. Finally, uh, I would like to introduce our third panelist for the evening, Professor Hilary Collar. Hilary earned a doctorate in toxicology from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and performed postdoctoral training at the Whitehead Institute and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. She focuses her research on understanding the molecular basis of cellular quiescence, a temporary state during which cells do not proliferate or divide to produce more cells. The ultimate aim of her work is to cure human diseases associated with excess cell proliferation, such as cancer, or perhaps the flip side of this, a lack of cell proliferation, such as chronic wounds. Hillary is investigating methods to prevent cancer resurgence by keeping quiescent cells in their inactive or dormant state, finding a way to target and kill them, or kicking them back into the proliferative state and targeting them with selective therapies. Tonight, she's going to tell you about her research on autophagy, the autophagy pathway, which could have major implications for healing chronic wounds and reducing cancer growth. In addition to being a professor in molecular cell and developmental biology, Hillary is a professor in UCLA's Department of Biological Chemistry and serves as interim director of UCLA's Molecular Biology Institute. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hillary Collar. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here today to talk with you on the occasion of Women's History Month. It's been a privilege to be part of the MCDB department at the, in the Division of Life Sciences at UCLA. The members of my department are outstanding scientists who are all excellent mentors and colleagues. I'm particularly proud to be part of a department with so many outstanding women scientists led by our chair, Professor Clark, and our dean, Professor Johnson. I'm really excited to tell you today about some of the research in my laboratory in which we're investigating a process of self-eating called autophagy in human health and disease. I'll start by telling you a little bit about my journey to UCLA. I went to college and graduate school in Boston and I studied biochemistry and molecular biology at Harvard and genetic toxicology at MIT. I then pursued postdoctoral training in cell cycle regulation in Seattle at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. I started my faculty career in New Jersey um, and I established my laboratory studying the difference between cells that are dividing and cells that aren't dividing uh, at Princeton University. And I'm delighted to be here at the Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology Department at UCLA. And here I've been continuing to study the difference between cells that divide and cells that don't divide um, and extended my studies to the field of autophagy. So this man over here is uh, Twitter CEO, Jack Dorsey, um, and he only eats one meal a day. The other celebrities shown here, um, Hugh Jackman, Kourtney Kardashian, Jennifer Aniston, um, they're also followers of intermittent fasting. So I wanna be clear, I'm not a dietitian, physician or nutritionist, and I'm not advocating any particular diet. Um, also, there really isn't evidence in humans that intermittent fasting is beneficial for people um, and fasting can be harmful for some people. But I start with this slide because the members of my laboratory and I have been, become very interested in the role of metabolism in cell biology and physiology. And in particular, we've been interested in the role of the process of autophagy, um, which is the rationale for these intermittent diets. So autophagy is a pathway of self-eating um, and it can be induced by nutrient limitation. So during autophagy, a cell will make a new sphere um, out of organelles, um, a new organelle and capture uh, material from the cytoplasm. So things like old and damaged proteins, protein complexes, and even entire organelles like ribosomes and mitochondria will be captured into these organelles. The organelles will then move um, and fuse with the lysosome. And the lysosome is the trash compactor of the cell. And once you form this fused molecule, fused organelle, the autolysosome, 
then the material that's inside the autolysosome will be degraded. The cell will be able to reclaim metabolites that are shown here, as well as to get some energy. So autophagy provides not just raw materials and energy, autophagy can also be used to clear bacteria and viruses from within the cell and to limit inflammation, which is the activation of your immune system to fight foreign invaders. Autophagy is also useful for degrading proteins in your brain that can form aggregates and contribute to neurodegenerative disease. So autophagy occurs in most cells most of the time, but it can increase in certain situations, including nutrient limitation. That's why fasting and calorie restriction can tell a cell that nutrients are unavailable, and so it should activate this autophagy process to sequester and burn cellular material for the energy and the metabolites. So this is part of the reason that people, including celebrities, engage in intermittent eating. There are also other ways to induce autophagy. So for instance, exercise, and there are small molecules that can induce autophagy. The autophagy pathway is likely reduced with aging, um, and in model organisms, treatments that induce autophagy can result in longer lifespans. So in my lab, we've been very interested in investigating the role of autophagy in different aspects of health and disease. In my laboratory, we've been using reporters that uh, allow us to identify autophagosomes. So if we look for a fusion between LC3, which is a protein that gets inserted onto the autophagosomes, and GFP and m cherry, um, we're able to visualize autophagosomes because they still have the green. And then once the fusion occurs with the lysosome, the green protein doesn't do well in low pH. Um, and so we see those as only red. So with this approach and using microscopes set up in an imaging core that was established by Amanda uh, Clark, our uh, chair, when she became chair of MCDB, we're now able to actually visualize autophagosomes, autolysosomes, and even learn about the dynamics of the autophagy process in cells, in mice, and actually in human tissues as well. So through this, we've been trying to understand where, when, and how autophagy is induced in the body. So one place where we've discovered that we observe autophagy is in wounded tissue. We found that tissue around a wound has higher levels of autophagy than normal skin. We then went and tested mice that are missing an important gene and therefore unable to induce autophagy. We found that these mice actually heal their wounds more slowly than normal mice. And we consider this an important discovery because a failure to heal wounds um, can result in chronic wounds as shown here. Chronic wounds are common and they're especially common in older patients and in diabetics. Um, they can be severely disabling um, and doctors really don't have very effective treatments. So we thought that it was particularly important that our lab found that the wounds in the mice that don't induce autophagy share a key property with chronic wounds found in humans, uh, which is that they have a higher level of inflammation. So we're now working with a collaborator, Axon Nubong, um, who's at UCLA and the Veterans Administration, and we're studying chronic wounds from human patients in order to understand whether the autophagy pathway is playing an important role in the development of these chronic wounds, and whether treatments like diet, exercise, or small molecules that induce autophagy might improve wound healing in patients with these chronic wounds. So in healthy people, um, autophagy is thought to be able to protect against the development of tumors. But once a tumor is formed, the tumor itself might, can rely on autophagy in order to progress um, and use autophagy as a way to get bigger and bigger. We found that not only the tumor itself, but also the cells around the tumor um, can induce autophagy and rely on autophagy. And the cells around the tumor are actually very important for allowing the tumors to grow and get bigger. So we've been discovering that actually, if the cells around the tumor can't turn on autophagy, then the tumor, which normally would be not seen very well by the immune system, actually becomes observed by the immune system. And, once, uh, and if autophagy is inhibited in these cells, um, then the immune system will target the tumor for death. So we think that this is a very exciting opportunity in order to be able to inhibit autophagy in the tumor and the tumor microenvironment around the tumor to make the tumors more uh, visible to the immune system and reduce tumor growth. And we're working with uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Crompton at UCLA, who's a surgeon, who's been working with us um, to collect tumors in order to study whether or not um, we can use autophagy inhibitors to prevent the growth of tumors. So in summary, 
The autophagy pathway is a process of self-eating induced by nutrient limitation and by exercise. Um, we think that the autophagy pathway is an exciting target for therapy. Um, we're attempting to induce autophagy to limit inflammation and promote wound healing. Um, and we're also trying to inhibit autophagy in the tumor microenvironment in order to help recruit the immune system and reduce the growth of tumors. So I want to thank all of the members of my laboratory who've worked so hard on these projects. Um, a special thank you to Ellen Zhang, who's an outstanding, tenacious woman scientist who spearheaded our work on melanoma. Um, thank you to all of these sources for funding, and thank you so much to you for joining us this evening. I feel very fortunate to be doing my research at UCLA, where I have access to incredible resources, and I'm supported by um, a wonderful team of lab members and outstanding colleagues um, like my colleagues here on this panel. Thank you, Hilary, for telling us about your inspiring research. Now let's continue the conversation with a Q&A featuring all three panelists. Please welcome back Professors Mikola, Lyons, and Kola. We look forward to addressing as many questions as possible. Okay, so, um, so, so Karen, I'm gonna start with you. And because this is an event about women in science, I thought that the question and answer would be fun to, to maybe tackle questions related to being a woman scientist rather than specifically about your research, but we can also uh, um, have questions about research um, if there is time. But Karen, I wanna start with you. When did you decide you wanted to be a scientist? Oh my goodness. I think I always knew I loved science, so, um... My first um, epiphany was when I was very young and I watched an ice cube melt. And I was just amazed watching the phase transition from a solid to a liquid and I had to know how that happened. And I don't think I've, I stopped asking questions uh, since then. Um, so it, it was natural. I think I went around, you know, and thinking actually about careers I, I um, let's see, I think I wanted to be a princess when I was about three. And after that, I wanted to be a veterinarian and then a medical doctor. But in the end, it was my love of science that propelled me to basic research. So um, I think there are many paths to get there, but um, I have loved my journey every step of the way. So it sounds like that following what you're passionate about, whether that's being a princess or being a scientist, is one of your words of wisdom for our young uh, female audience members out there tonight. I think so. I think if you do that, if you do what you love, you will not regret any of your choices. So Hannah, a question to you. I also traveled across the world to embark on my training in the United States. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about what drew you to the United States for your research and then what made you decide to stay rather than going back to Europe to launch your career here in the US and at UCLA? Okay, so um, when I was doing my PhD in Finland, my co-mentor and a wonderful role model wonderful female scientist, Lena Belton, and she taught early that uh, if you want to do the science at the highest level, you need to work with the best people who are really doing the most cutting edge things. So routinely, we were sent to all around the world to learn a new technique and bring it back. So there was no sitting at home in your corner and, and crying why you can't do it. So uh, after that experience, uh, it was only natural that uh, after I finished my MD and PhDs that I, I wanted to look at the map and say, where are the best people in my, um, in my area? My area? And uh, there's a funny little anecdote. I, I wanted to go to Stu Orkin's lab in Boston and I interviewed and I thought it went really well and said I wanted to come. And he said, uh, we actually don't have space right now. And uh, I was too naive to understand that that meant that I wasn't a priority, but I told him that, okay, can you put me on a waiting list? I'm gonna go to Sweden to learn about stem cells and come back when you have room. Like, why would I go to the second best lab, uh, you know, if I'm making this far move from far away from home? And I think it ultimately worked out well for everybody. I got to learn a very important uh, biology of hematopoietic stem cells from Lund. And, and ultimately I got to work with my, the scientists who I admired admired the most. So uh, that was the first part of the story. The second part, what made me decide to stay? It was a tough one because of course uh, uh, I was uh, 
you know, I have a wonderful uh, family and friends and, and, and great uh, colleagues uh, um, in Finland and Sweden, and they were inviting me back, but something in my gut said, you're not quite ready to go yet. And uh, that there was more to be done, more to be learned. Of course, my home is always there. And because of that support, I can be here far away because I never had to give them away. And uh, the UCLA came kind of in the late in the game, uh, but actually when I when I visited and I talked to the people, and uh, at that time it was just voted that California will put money for stem cells, and uh, the excitement and talking to the leadership here, I, I was I, I told them I'm, I'm coming. I don't need any other offers. I don't need anything else. And I must say that I've never re regretted that choice uh, one day of my life. Thank you so much, Hannah. And I joined the MCV department a year after you. And I have to say that one of the reasons I joined was because of your enthusiasm for MCV UCLA and everything that you had achieved just in that very short period of time. So it's wonderful to hear that story. Thank you. Hilary, so my question to you is, what, what drew you to UCLA? So I was really excited to come to UCLA for, for many reasons. For me, the close connection between the college and the medical school with both being right on the same campus was really appealing because I thought I would have opportunities to interact with um, people with clinical backgrounds and that it would give me an opportunity to do research that was more uh, clinically relevant. Um, and I was also really excited basically to join all of you. I was really drawn to this department because um, it seemed to have an unusually strong cohort of uh, people who are outstanding scientists and also kind, supportive, and optimistic people. Um, and especially there were so many really strong scientists who were women in the department was a big draw for me. So Karen, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges that women face today, women scientists? Uh, well, first of all, I have to say things have changed tremendously over my career. Um, I'm the oldest person on this panel, and I can remember my advisor when I was an undergraduate actually telling me I shouldn't go into science because it would mean that I couldn't have a family. So that was, um, that was alarming, and I'm glad that those, those kinds of things don't get said to women um, anymore. I hope not. Uh, anyway, I do know, and, and because I, I think about this and, and read the literature, that women as a group do feel that they are not taken as seriously as men. And there are many reasons for this, but um, this comes down to not being paid as much as men in general and um, not getting the recognition. And the way that we fix that is by having events like this one, by seeing our female dean of the life science division, our female chairs of departments, and by seeing people giving talks. I know Hannah is going to be speaking at Harvard tomorrow, and that's the solution. We um, we promote other women, we promote ourselves, we promote our um, our the students we train, and things are definitely getting better every every year. So I think that um, I want to say for women, take a risk. The fact that you may feel less noticed um, doesn't mean, um, it, it just means go get out there, put yourself out there, let people see you. Thank you so much, Karen. I absolutely agree with your comments that women need to help bring up other women. And as women move into leadership positions, it's really important to continue bringing women scientists up with them as well, so that there are so that we can create seats at the table for women from diverse backgrounds, um, from international places, or from different parts of the United States. And and so actually, what I'm seeing a lot more of now. And I'm I'm curious about how the three of you think about this. Is the is is when we're going to meetings or organizing seminar series, men and women actually are starting to turn down uh, uh, requests for or invitations to speak at a, in a panel if the panel is made up of all white men. And so I think even very bold moves like that are helping to, to, for organizing committees to, to make change and to recognize that the best science is the diverse, the most diverse science that we can, um, that we can um, discuss and put in front of us. So, um, so that's something that I'm noticing as well. Um, so Hillary, 
what recommend you're a mum just like me what recommendations do you have for good work-life balance for women scientists with families so i I think that being a scientist is challenging and can be very time consuming. I think that being a mom is also challenging and can be time consuming. Um, and trying to do them both at the same time can be difficult. Um, and I think it's easy to feel guilty for whatever it is you're not doing at any particular time. Um, so I think that my advice is to try to find a work-life balance that works for you so that you can enjoy your science while you're doing it. Um, and to also make sure that you have a uh, good quality time that you spend with your children and to give yourself permission to um, enjoy that time as well. Yeah, sometimes I think as women scientists um, with families, we tend to put ourselves last because there's a lot of needs <laughs> that uh, we need to take care of. And, um, and so I, I agree with you. I think um, some, that having time for yourself, remembering yourself uh, and, that, and that you also need to recharge whether you have a family or not uh, is so critical because the wonderful thing about science, I think, is that it's just consuming, especially this is not a job for any of us. It's, you know, it's a career and it's a love and it's something that will just continue on for the rest of our lives and change in really remarkable and unexpected ways. And so, so there's no such thing as Monday and Friday. It's, it's Sunday, it's, Saturday, it's, it's Monday to Sunday, Monday to Sunday all the time. So creating those moments of, of break and recharge is so important for all of us. So Hannah, I'm turning to you now. Um, how can networking with other scientists enhance your career? So um, I think uh, whether you call it networking or, or communicating or collaborating, it's at the end of the day, it's all about the people. None of us, we can do this alone. It, we, it's not fun, but it's hard when you do it together, it's way more fun. But I think it really has a concrete, uh, not just how you feel, but, but it, it has a concrete effect on your career. I went to my first conference when I was 23 year old medical school and I went to New York, big city, wow. And uh, uh, I was studying factor 13 uh, deficiency at the time. So I wrote every poster that had a word factor 13 and I went and I introduced myself to uh, every one of them, but uh, I wanted to know everything that anybody wanted to do know about uh, Factor 13. But from that, I started getting invitations to Factor 13 meetings to speak. I started sending, uh, getting letters, dear Professor Mikola, would you like to analyze the mutations from our patient? And I was 23 year old medical student. But that was so inspiring. It told me that you don't have to have a fancy title uh, the, to be an integral mem member of the community. And I think that that really inspired my career. And it's really good to get out there to see that your work matters. When you are in the lab and things don't always work, you just don't know where you are even <laughs> in, this, in this big universe. So I think it's absolutely, uh, absolutely essential. And uh, for also, if you are a um, you know, wanting to become a BI and uh, people often hide in their labs before their big paper comes. But no, you have to get there out there early, get involved in your society, get people to, to notice you, because that's, first of all, way more fun for you. But that's the way people remember you and when they think about invitations uh, for the next time. I also think one of the, um, the hidden benefits of being a scientist, I know it's challenging right now in COVID, is that being a scientist means that, you know, science is done all over the world. Science is global. And so what that means is that your next collaborator could be in China. It could be, you know, in London. It could be somewhere really exciting. So, so as a scientist, we get to travel to all of these fantastic places and meet smart and innovative people who I think collectively do honestly want to work together. And I think that's what's been wonderful um, to see as a scientist uh, in terms of the creation of vaccines. The creation of vaccines so quickly occurred because scientists were willing to work together, that there was a network that was already pre-existing because we go to meetings and we speak to other scientists, we want to learn from each other. And when that was needed, that pre-existing network was leveraged and then we were able to get vaccines. So this is, this, this is the case whether you're as a molecular cell and developmental biologist or, um, or working as an immunologist. It's, it's the same blueprint we all, all use, that networking is what helps us to get science done faster, but it's also really fun to do science that way in a community. So thank you so much, Hannah, for sharing that with us.
And we've been on the same dance floor with the, one of the developers of Moderna, so. That's right, we have. <laughs> A shout out to Derek Rossi if he's listening. <laughs> so Hilary, um, are there female leaders in the field um, who have inspired you and why? Uh, yes, absolutely. There are a number of um, women who uh, I've taken inspiration from. Um, so women like Gertrude Elian, who uh, worked on purine nucleotide metabolism and was one of the first to come up with antiviral drugs. Barbara McClintock, who studied maize chromosomes. Catherine Johnson, who's in the movie Hidden, F uh, Hidden Figures. Um, Flossie wong Stahl was the first scientist to clone HIV and got her PhD in molecular biology from UCLA. Um, Elizabeth Blackburn was a pioneer in tel of telomeres. Uh, Elaine Fuchs uh, taught, us, taught me so much about hair follicle stem cells. Um, I had a colleague at Fred Hutchinson, Sue Biggins, who's uh, taught the world a lot about cell division. Um, Angelica Amman um, was a really wonderful scientist who uh, studied chromosome loss and aneuploidy. Um, and the women here at UCLA, including those who are here today and others like Catherine Platt and Dean Kelsey Martin um, from the Med School have all been really inspirational for me. Thank you, Hilary. So I'm gonna um, finish with two more questions, one to um, Karen and, and one to Hannah. Uh, there are different topics and then we'll close out the evening. So Karen, how has, your, how has COVID changed the way you and your team do research? Well, it really has had a profound impact. I mean, at first it was um, scary and sad because we had to slow everything down and, and stop our breeding. And, uh, and, and, you know, we miss the energy of the undergrads not being in the lab. That was, that was a really hard thing to adjust to. But it gets back to some positive things, so some things that you and Hannah and Hillary have all talked about, and that's about networking. We reached out to our colleagues around the world and this was sort of an informal thing. We have informal Zoom chats about data, just like big lab meetings where we just talk and share just like we would do at a normal meeting, but it's all enabled by the, um, by, by the Zoom platform. And um, we got a lot of collaboration started that way, which cars are open at your university, which ones are open at ours, send us your samples, we'll do this, you do that. So I think that's been really um, wonderful and, and um, it, it's, it's formed great bonds and, and there's been nothing but collaboration. So I think I'll end there to give you a chance to end with your last question. Thank you so much, Karen. Hannah, do you have words of wisdom to share with aspiring female scientists? Our last question. So uh, I've had an uh, opportunity to work with so many wonderful, talented uh, women scientists. And, uh, and, uh, but somehow, sometimes it feels like the women don't trust in their abilities to pursue it as a career. They're equally talented, if not more talented or, or, or accomplished as their male colleagues. And some of them, they say, I don't think I can be like you, or I don't think I want to be like you. You've sacrificed too much. And, uh, uh, and I tell them, you don't need to be like me. I have lots of faults. You know, uh, be yourself. Uh, it, it's really the diversity that brings the science forward. When I went to Stu Orkin's lab, I was so, man, I want to learn how to be like Stu. And I came out of there like, I could never be like Stu. I would be a lousy Stu Orkin. So I really have to build on my own strengths uh, to make it uh, in, in my career. And the other point I wanted to make, we sometimes you can't, like, you don't always have to be 500%. We always give the best we can. Uh, it doesn't always have to be 500%. This may come up when you're thinking about uh, starting a family. For me personally, this was very concrete when I went through breast cancer treatments, especially after the second round when the when the treatments were really beating me to the ground and you're kind of a brain fog and losing your self-confidence and you wonder, can I really keep doing that? Uh, but the science kept telling me, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's too good to, to stop now. And, uh, and I think that, that that's an important lesson. Like, you know, we don't have to be superhumans. Uh, uh, we do the best we can. And, and for me, at least the science has told me like, thank you for staying. We're finally answering the questions that we wanted to answer since uh, 20 years ago. So I think my word of wisdom is if you love it, go for it. And the rest can be just figured out. 
Thank you, Hannah. That's inspiring. If you love it, just do it. And <laughs> we're going to end it on that note. So thank you, everyone, for joining us for Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology's conversation on women in science. We hope you enjoyed the event and have learned something tonight that you will take with you. We also hope that this event showcased the critical role that women play in scientific discovery, education, and innovation. To all of you aspiring female scientists out there, don't give up. If you love it, just do it. This webinar has been recorded. We will send a post-event email with the link to the recording. Please feel free to share it with others. We will also provide you with the department's website and a follow-up email. We hope you will visit the website and learn about the impactful work going on in molecular cell and developmental biology. Yes, we do have male colleagues who we love dearly, so we want you to take a look at their work as well. Thank you again for joining us for this important conversation and have a good evening. Good night. <laughs>